good evening all welcome to the interesting case of the month i would like to thank dr sharath kumar ji ji who is senior consultant diagnostic and intervention neuroradiologist at apollo hospitals bangalore he has contributed both these cases diagnosed and treated these cases history coming to the history 27 year old female incidence in onset of headache since 20 days headache gets better and resolves completely in supine posture headache aggravates in standing posture or erect posture so there is a postural variation of headache in this case these are the sagittal t1 weighted images and sagittal t2 weighted images you can see there is mild inferior descent of the tonsil there is mild inferior descent of the brain stem with sagging of the brain stem there is mild sagging of the carpus callosum there is even distension of the suprasagittal sinus and even straight sinus even you can see this is the venous distension which is called as venous distension sign there is effacement or collapse of the periopteric sheaths of sheaths and even there is on sagittal post contrast even weighted images you can see this is engorgement of the pituitary gland this is the pachymeningeal thickening or enhancement and even the distended venous sinuses and inferior descent of tonsil as we have already seen next these are the sagittal post contrast sequences this is the delayed scans where you can see there is a progressive pachymeningeal thickening or enhancement Next, there is an acute venous hinge angle in this case with pachymeningeal thickening or enhancement on delayed scans. This venous hinge angle is nothing but the angle which is formed between the lines which is drawn along the internal cerebral veins and vein of gallon. Normally, it is obtuse and if it is acute, nearly taking, taken as a cutoff of 79 degrees or acute angles suggest there is kinking of the carpus callosum and sagging of the brainstem and sagging of the carpus callosum which leads to venous hinge sign. Next, in the same case, you can see these are the sagittal T2 weighted images. You can see there is a longitudinal hyperintense collection in the epidural space. And this hypointense line is the dura. And the, this is clearly seen on axial weighted images. This yellow arrows indicates the ep longitudinal epidural collection. And this hypointense line is the displaced dura, which is deep to the collection. So these are nothing but spinal longitudinal epidural collections. And also you can see there is a bony spur with calcified disc in this case at L1, L2 vertebral level. So this is the main culprit in this case which is causing the dural tear with CSF leak into the epidural space and leading to all these symptoms we have seen and signs we have seen on the imaging. These are the zoomed images you can see this is the calcified spur and this is the calcified disc and what is the technique we have to use for diagnosing is ultra dynamic CT myelogram scans to detect the CSF leak. Here the plane scan of the whole spine is done. LP is done and we have to confirm with injection of 0.5 ml contrast. Distend the thecal sac with 20 ml of normal saline. Then fill the tube with 300 ml of 300, 300 omnipack contrast that is 10 ml we have to take. Start the scan and inject contrast simultaneously. Two runs have to be done. One is caudal to cranial, other one is cranial to caudal. And even delayed scans have, can be done after 5 minutes. The, and the patient is kept in prone position with tenderloin position with 20 degrees elevation from the table. This is the ultra dynamic CT myelogram which is done to see the site of the CSF leak and localization of the CSF leak and also for the treatment of the CSF leaks. So in the same case ultra fast CT dynamic myelogram you can see this is the bony spur and the calcified disc which is causing the dural tear with CSF seen in the epidural space and here this is the epidural air which is injected and here the injected epidural blood mixed with contrast is injected at the level of L1 vertebral level to seal the CSF leak. So this is the treatment which is used that is epidural blood patch treatment to seal the CSF leak at the level of L1 in this case. Next case 44 year old female incidence in onset of headache since 20 days headache aggravates with posture. You can see there are subdural collections bilateral subdural collections along bilateral cerebral convex T's which are variable signal intensity. Here these are the subdural collections and also you can see there is a spinal longitudinal epidural collection in this case and this hypointense line is the displaced dura which is deep to the collection. So there are bilateral subdural collections and even spinal longitudinal epidural collection in this case. So this is the spinal longitudinal epidural collection. These are the subdural collections or hygromas. So SLC, SL, SLEC is positive in this case. Next there is venous distance and sign is also positive. And even there is pachymeningeal enhancement and in the delayed scans there is progressive pachymeningeal enhancement or thickening in this case. Next ultrafast CT dynamic myelogram was performed 
and the leak was identified at the level of C6, C7 level and also treated with epidural blood patch. So what is this spontaneous intracranial hypertension which occurs due to CSF leaks? This is mostly underdiagnosed entity, mostly leaky spinal but the manifestations are in brain. Neuroradiologist and interventional radiologist plays a key role in the management of this case. Clinical manifestations are nothing but orthostatic headache which is the most common symptom which is presented in these cases. So type there are four types of leaks. Type 1 leak is due to this ventral that is a calcified spurs or calcified discs which are causing the tear in the dura with, with leak of the CSF into the epidural space. Type 2 leaks are nothing but the proximal nerve root tear tear in the pro at the level of proximal nerve root with leak of the CSF into the epidural space. Type 3 is nothing but there will be CSF venous fistula that is fistula is formed between the epidural venous plexus and the CSF and there will be leaked CSF around the uh, venous plexus or formation of pseudomeningocele. Type 4 is tear at the level of distal nerve root with leak of the CSF into the epidural space. So these are the four types of leaks type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 CSF leaks which are nothing but seen in spontaneous intracranial hypertension. So what are the qualitative signs and quantitative signs we can see in this case are these type of cases are subdural effusions or subdural hematomas, engorgement or enlargement of the pituitary, engorgement of the venous structures as we have seen that is venous distension sign, even prominence of inter intercavernous sinus sign, pachymeningeal enhancement or thickening which is the most common finding as we have seen in delayed scans, sagging of the brainstem and corpus callosum, tonsillar ectopia or descent, decreased fluid or FAS CSF around the optic nerve sheath and diffuse cell blood edema. So you can remember the mnemonic as seeps down. So CSF seeps down, the tonsil seeps downwards. So you remember as seeps down. So these are the mnemonic. You can easily remember all the qualitative signs in spontaneous intercal hypertension. These are the quantitative signs. Next, what is the what is the important hypothesis we can remember for all these features? That subdural effusions or engorgement of the pituitary or engorgement of the venous structures, pachymeningeal enhancement. We can remember by Monroe Kelly hypothesis. This Monroe Kelly hypothesis is our brain is a rigid structure which contains lots of uh, three or four components and the volume of these three components remains nearly constant in a state of dynamic equilibrium. So the brain contains normally 1700 ml which is composed of brain tissue as 1400 ml, CSF as 150 ml and blood is 150 ml. So any decrease in one component should be compensated by increase in the other. That is the cause for this features in spontaneous intercal hypertension. Because of the decrease in the CSF, it has to be compensated by increase in the blood. So that leads to the signs of venous distension, pachymeningeal enhancement due to epidural venous plexus enlargement and even subdural hygromas. So these try to compensate the CSF leak. And also this Monroe Kelly hypothesis can be seen in sulcal effacement in brain edema, brain shift in, in intracranial hypertension too. So in people with spontaneous intracranial hypertension, the zero pressure point moves downwards leading to negative intracranial pressure in the brain which leads to expulsion of the CSF in upright posture with possible venous dilatation causing this orthostatic headache. So zero pressure point is shifted downwards in SIH which is the cause of orthostatic headache. Next all the features we have already seen, this is the venous distension sign, this is the pachymeningeal enhancement or thickening, sometimes superficial siderosis can be seen, there is enlargement of the cella, there is prominence of the intercavernous sinus, even effacement of the supracellar system and even subdural collections. What is this burn score? We will see in the next slide. So burn score is calculated in the sagittal sections of the brain because in this spontaneous intercal hypertension because of the displacement of the brainstem downwards, there is three of the measurements which are taken which are altered in this case of spontaneous intercal hypertension. The first one is supracellar system. Second one is the distance between the mammillary pontine distance. This is the mammillary bodies and the pons. This is the mammillary pontine distance. And third one is the prepontine system. So supracellar system, mammillary pontine distance and prepontine systems. So burn score has, is given depending upon the major criteria, minor criteria. Major criteria is engorgement of the venous sinuses, pachymeningeal enhancement and supracellar systems less than 4 mm. Each are given a score of 2. Minor criteria are subdural fluid collection, prepontine systems less than 5 mm, mammillopontine distance less than 6.5 mm. Each are given a score of 1. So low risk is less than 2 points, intermediate risk is 3 to 4 points and if the burn score is greater than 5, it is significant and it's, they fall into high risk. Next, what are the other differential diagnosis or mimickers of the spontaneous intercal hypertension are carry type 1 malformation, subdural fluid collections, 
Conditions with dural thickening, as we have seen, as pachymeningeal thickening, which can be seen in IgG4 disease, neurosarcoidosis, neurotuberculosis, or even autoimmune diseases. Sometimes POTS, that is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, orthostatic hypotension, cervicogenic headache, or vestibular migraine. You can see these are the differentiating features. You can pause the slide and see all those differentiating features. Sometimes there will be other coexisting conditions with spontaneous intracranial hypertension. They are cerebral venous as thrombosis, which is due to stasis leading to thrombosis, frontotemporal dementia, which is due to obstructive venous flow and swelling of the diencephalon, which may lead to behavioral changes, pituitary enlargement or hypoplexy, which is due to congestion of the hypofacial veins, POTS can be also coexistent. Superficial siderosis, which is due to venous traction and skull base causing microhemorrhages, which leads to superficial siderosis. Next, dynamic digital subtraction myelography and cetomyelography in prone position should be done for type 1 leaks and in lateral decumit disposition for type 2 and type 3 leaks, as we have already seen. Then, if the clinical signs and symptoms are suspicious of spontaneous intracranial hypertension, go for a trial conservative therapy for bed rest and hydration. Then, if there is no response, then go for the MRI. If MRI shows the features of intracranial hypertension as quantitative signs and qualitative signs with high burn score, then if it is yes, then definitely go for an epidural blood patch and fibrin patch. And if there is response in 72 hours, this is definitely a case of spontaneous intracranial hypertension and no further imaging is required. And if there is no response in 72 hours, then go for a CT myelography with open pressure and later go for a surgical consultation with surgical repair. If there are signs of intracranial hypertension on MRI or not there on MRI and then go for CT myelography with opening pressure and there is visualization of extra thecal CSF then definitely go for this treatment line and if it is not there then definitely consider alternative diagnosis and even nuclear scintigraphy. Next what are all the other treatments we can consider for these CSF leaks are one or more autologous epidural blood patches as we have seen in this case will treat 30 to 70 percent of spontaneous intracranial hypertension hypertension patients with marked improvement and if the epidural patches are not showing improvement then minimally invasive surgical closure of the tears in, in of type 1 and type 2 leaks or ever the tears around the nerve roots can be considered and csf venous fistulas can be treated with surgical ligation of the nerve root with fibrin glue injections into the neural foramina or with liquid embolic, embolic agents like onyx into the radicular veins. So these are all the treatment options for CSF leaks. So remember this one of the cause of spontaneous intracranial hypertension which is mostly underdiagnosed. So as one of the cause of orthostatic hypertension, orthostatic headache cases, chronic orthostatic headache cases, spontaneous intracranial hypertension should be considered. These are all the references. Thank you all.